Welcome to Chasing Spindles, my life being crappy and everything crafty. My name is Sasha. Um, you can also find me as Spin Pixie everywhere on the interwebs. And today is going to be a pretty long show. I will try to be as descriptive as possible. Um, but if I confuse you or if you get lost, show notes as ever will be up on the blog at chasingspindles.blogspot.com. Um, a couple of show notes. The high schoolers are getting out right now. I have my window closed, but it offers absolutely no, uh, soundproofing. So, um, if you hear loud music, I apologize. Um, I just got home, and I tried to record yesterday, but that was a fiasco and a half. Um, so today I'm doing it again, and hopefully that'll, that'll work better. Um, I have a lot of things to show you, works in progress, and... As far as um, yesterday went with the natural dyeing, or Monday, I should say. Okay, so let's get to it. Weak speak. Um, I think I'm going to change that to on the decks. It has to do with the whole DJ thing, and you cannot see my turntables with it right here. So I'm going to change it to on the decks. Okay, on the decks. So first of all, I'm going to preface all of this by saying I'm in a little bit of pain. Because on the bus, I whacked the crap out of my knee on this, I guess it was a metal, like a brace where it holds the seat to the bus. I don't know how that works. Well, it's like the barrier that goes in front of, like you're sitting in the seat, and then there's the barrier with a little pole thingy, and then there's a step, and then another step. The first step is totally beyond me, but um, I whacked my knee as I was getting out, and it's kind of doing this twitchy thing. It's really weird, so... Um, I'm gonna go like this, so I don't know if you can see me doing this, but I'm rubbing the hell out of my knee right now. Um, and then I went and walked about a mile and a half on it, so. Um, so, yesterday, or I keep saying yesterday, but it was really Monday, um, Chaotic Hooker, who is Amber from the Chaotic and Crafty podcast, found at www.chaoticandcrafty.com, by the way, she came over and we were doing this venture in natural dyeing. Um, so last week, if you remember, we went to Michael's and we got all the tools that we were going to need to naturally dye. Um, um, but this week we need, actually got the dye elements. So, um, what we did was we went to Michael's, we went to the grocery store that's around the corner from my house just about, and we purchased grapes for the blue, beets for the red, and onions for orange. Um, and I was going to use the turmeric, but we didn't have or the turmeric, but we didn't have um, enough bowls for it, so we just used those three colors. Premordants and mordants. We used vinegar and cream of tartar. Um, I won't go into step by step, but I will. What I will do is I will go ahead and post right here all the footage or no you know I'll just leave it till the end you guys can see it at the end um okay so basically long story short this is how the progress this is how the process went we got to my house we went to the grocer got all the produce we needed and I bought stuff to make us lunch um so then as we have the water boiling for lunch we're chopping up all the veggies and the fruit and stuff like that so I've got burners that I'm watching I'm chopping up vegetables we have water and vinegar dye baths for the yarn uh, Amber bought a skein of um, white fisherman's wool I believe and then I was just dyeing my hand spun um, and then I dyed a microfiber bag which I didn't think was going to take at all but the shocking thing is what you'll see later on um, so we got everything done, um, the chopping and everything, and then what I did was I poured boiling water into the beets, into the grapes, and into the onion skins. They were red onion skins. Um, so I poured the water into there to make like a tea and let it steep. And then what we did was we took the, the yarn out of the dye bath to let it sit in the steeping tea. Um, then it wasn't really changing just by sitting in the tea, so then what we did is we moved it to jars in a pot. So we got like a pan, I don't really have anything around here to show you, but it's a pretty big pan that's about about that high and then round enough to comfortably fit three um, spaghetti sauce jars. Um, so then what we did was we 
put the dyes, um, the natural um, dye tea in the juice, straining all the vegetables out. Um, and then we put that on the pan, or in the pan, and then we put it to boil. And then we put the yarn in, we section it off into three different jars. Um, now after about letting that sit for about an hour or so, and by the way, we're recording her podcast as we're eating lunch or making lunch and doing the, the prep for the, for the, um, the dyeing. So it was ridiculously hectic and chaotic. So, um, so after we did that, um, we had, we, we left it about an hour, maybe a little longer because it was, it sat for about a good hour or almost two hours in the dye bath. So then we put it, when we were boiling it, we boiled it for about an hour and we checked on it and nothing happened. Like the dye was still, the yarn was still white. So we let it sit for a little while longer and um, the most it did was it turned kind of dingy in some spots. Like the part with the grapes, it was like a breath of blue. It was like a, like a, a blue. And then the pink was like a light, light light pink like a rose petal pink um and then but but it, they did take it was just very um invisible it's like you have to it was not something that you would want to make something out of because it was very faded looking um so the onion part that turned like the dingiest color it didn't turn like orange it turned like a rust color um so after a little while longer, we were kind of pressed for time because Amber was leaving at 5 o'clock. Um, her ride was picking her up at 5 o'clock, so we had to kind of proceed. Um, well, we let it set, sit for a little while, in, boiling in the water, and it just was not working. Um, so I, Amber was kind of feeling like she wasted her yarn, and I think she was kind of getting discouraged. So it was at that point that I pulled out the cake dye, and what I did was I added about two drops to the blue and then we added two drops to the red or maybe three drops to the red to make it a little darker and then we added like a good deal to the onion because it was so so like um it was like a faint faint orange so um we added like four drops of cake dye to the onion and then we added a little more water to um let the jars let the dye come up so it was like the jar was probably you know about a normal spaghetti sized jar and then we had it like this much filled with natural dye and then with the cake dye and the water we filled it the rest of the way up so it was about like so it was about like that much more um like yeah about that much more liquid that we added to it um and then we stirred it up really well and then we let that sit for about an hour now that showed progress and actually I have a picture of what that looked like um, now let me say again, we did not take the natural teas out of these jars. We simply added a little more water and some cake dye to the mix. Um, now when we did that, we got the most beautiful blue I have ever seen. Um, and it was not the color that was on the jar, or on the cake box, like the cake dye box. The cake dye box was kind of like a, a it showed it being a pale, like baby blue. But we got this, and I really hope it's not really glary. I hope you can see this pretty well. There we go. See that pretty blue? And then those, that's the blue. I'm pointing at my computer screen like you can see me. But the, um, you can see that's the grapes, and then right over there is the, um, is the beets. And then in the back is the onion. So that's pretty much what it looked like. Now I've got to fix my camera. Um, so that's pretty much what it looked like, um, and they were very pretty colors. Now, um, so after that set for a while, um, Amber did have a skein of finished yarn, and she sent me a picture of it. So this is Amber's finished yarn. What happened was, after we let it sit in the water, there was a part where, um, after we let it sit in the dye, excuse me, there was a part where it was kind of 
it had come up to the middle of the arm, but it didn't go into the middle of the arm. So what, what we did was we took it out of the pan or the pot, whatever one it is, the pot. We took it out of the pot um, and we um, laid it out on the dyeing tin, that, that the turkey tin. So after we took it out of the pot and laid it out on the turkey tin, we um, she poured some of the blue dye onto her yarn. Um, and what happened is where there was blue that was kind of red, she got a really pretty purple and a turquoise color. And then where there was the orange, she kind of tried to over dye that with the blue and she ended up with a, like a muddy spot about that big of kind of like brownish, I think. So all in all, I think it was a really pretty um, skein of yarn. It has pink in there from the beads. That was like the lighter colors is where it actually naturally dyed. And um, so it's kind of a mix of cake dyed and natural dyed. Um, and I think it looks very pretty. Um, I think that there are some spots that she might want to over dye, but um, I think it came out looking good. As for uh, mine, I will get to, I'll show you mine in, um, in uh, I made it slash epic pass, epic fail. Um, I didn't do as much as she did. She did a whole skein. I did just the hand spun that I had been spinning that was not dyed. Um, I think that it's a, a game of mordants versus, um, elements, and you have to find out which combination actually works properly together. So, um, we tried vinegar and cream of tartar as our mordants, so next time I'd really like to try vinegar and alum. I don't believe that cream of tartar is a very strong mordant. As a matter of fact, I almost don't even know what it did, except for make the dye st the yarn stink. Um, I am not deterred from doing this, and I will try it again when I can get some alum and when I can have a um, more uh, hand spun to dye to to be able to dye. Um, I don't know if Amber will continue to do this. I don't know if it was like her thing or not. Um, so I can't really speak for that. You'll have to tune into her podcast, I guess, next week to find out. Um, and that's pretty much all I can say. But what I'll, what I'll end that little bit with is the fact that when you're doing something creative and it's something new that you've never done before, you can't be attached to the outcome. Just like if you were playing a trumpet for the first time, you wouldn't think that you could break off with like a Revly or something like that. Um, it's just, it's new. You start slow and then you get better as time progresses. And I think that Amber had an attachment to what her outcome should have been. And I kind of, I didn't. I kind of had a feeling that it would be exactly what it was because it was our first time. Um, but so that was pretty much it. I really hope that she would like to continue to try and figure out what natural dyes work because I, I really totally think it's a really interesting process to see how things happen. Next is Craft That Whip. So today, today in Craft That Whip, we have a ton of works in progress. Some I can show you, some I can't show you, and some I really don't want to show you because, God, is it painful to look at. So let's get the bad news out of the way. Okay, so <clears throat> the Red Baron Cowl. Um, I told you last week that I was working on this thing called the Red Baron Cowl, and it was sort of an homage to my grandmother. Um, so it's named after her, um, because at the time I was using her yarn, which this is, and her needles, which now I've moved them to straight needles because it's just easier. Um, I have put this in a temporary hiatus um, because I'm having an issue, and I don't know exactly how to fix the issue that I am having. So let me show you my Ravelry clerk and other knitting friends. Um, we got wonky drop stitch here. This is what made me just, just top, like stop, completely stop. I don't know what happened here, but we have something weird going on right here. This shouldn't be like that. And then this was a stitch and I have to fix whatever's going on there. Um, and then, where is my yarn? 
Okay. And then right here, you can see this humongous ginormic hole that I can actually see you guys through. Um, now, I don't know how that ha- well, I know how it happened, but I don't know how to fix it. See, basically what happened is there was a point when I was knitting on the circulars that I had a hole here. Um, I a stitch fell. Basically, no. Okay. Let's try that again, Sasha. Breathe. <laughs> okay. So what happened was when I was knitting, I, I was mindlessly knitting and then I kind of became conscious of what I was doing. And as I became conscious of what I was doing, I totally forgot what step of the knitting process I was in. Thereby, I pulled the needle out. And when I pulled the needle out, I ended up with two loops. I didn't end up with a stitch, I ended up with two ginormic bunny ear looking loops on the end of my needle. So I asked my sister, who's a bit more advanced at knitting than I am, what I should do. And she told me to just knit them. So I just knit them. And that is what ensued. Um, not only that, but I have a drop stitch right here. Um, so th there's just a lot of things that I need to fix on this cowl. So it is temporarily going to sleep until such time as I can fix it. Now as far as the drop stitches, that's no big deal. I've picked up drop stitches before. In Garter it is a PIA. Um, actually it's a PETA, I suppose. <laughs> um, but so yeah um i will in fact get back to work on this um the reason it's in hiatus right now is because i can't frog it my usual solution would just be to frog it and start all over again but if this were being done when my grandmother was alive she would tell me that i shouldn't frog it that i should figure out how to fix it and moreover, she would make me figure out how to fix it. She would help me, but she would make me figure out how to fix it. So I'm asking for help. If I can figure out how to fix it, I will fix it. But I cannot frog it. So. Because that's how my grandma would have made me work it. So that's one work in progress. The second work in progress I can show you. Um, actually, I take that back. I, ca I can show you two works in progress. Second work in progress. Um, for a beginner, it is always good to have mindless knitting no matter what stage of knitting and crafting you're in. Um, but for a beginner, it's the easiest stuff to do, I guess, that you want to use is mindless knitting. Therefore, and though it is a bad yarn, though it is a bad color choice, I'm using this, um, these needles and this scar, uh, this yarn to, um, to do a scarf or something of that extent. And basically what this is just is, is just when I'm watching TV and mindlessly knitting, I practice every technique that I've learned thus far. Um, what I've got here are some garter stitches. I started this, um, last night, I think. These are all just garter stitches, and as you can see, I've I've got my garter stitch pretty down pat. It's nice and nicely gauged. It's not tight. It's not loose. It's perfect for me. Um, it's all scrunchy like this because it's longer than the needles are. Um, but um, I will practice garter, which is this is about enough garter, um, and then I will practice pearl stitch. Then I'll practice stockinette, and then I will practice seed stitch and moss stitch. And just go on as I learn more and more different techniques. Um, so that's, this is just like my mindless knitting. It'll probably be a snuggle maybe by the time it's done. Or um, a cowl or a scarf or something. Blanket for the dog or the cat. It'll be something. It's just my techniques though. It's my techniques watch I guess for now. Um... I can show you something else that's nothing right now I just casted it on this morning okay so um let's see you're actually supposed to see this later on in the show uh oh uh oh oh no that's not good hold on sorry I had a runaway ball <laughs> um 
you're actually not supposed to see what I'm about to show you until later on in the show because all of it is new. New yarn and new needles. So just understand that I'm taking away from part of the show to show you something now. And you also can't see the bag that it's in, because that's for later on in the show. Okay, so this morning, I casted this on, and I got these needles last week when I went to go, um, when I was in Santa Ana. Okay. So this is yarn um, that I found in my stash, donated to me by a chaotic cooker, who is Amber. Um, I don't know who it's by or the colorway, but I think it's very pretty. It is a sport weight, I believe. Um, and I am doing them on, I'm working with this on size 4 Clover circular knitting needles. Just basic in the round stuff, working on my rounding stuff. Most of the time I have these long bus checks for work, and I have nothing to do except for listen to my iPod. Um, and it gets boring, and I don't want to like deal with the stuff I hear on the bus because I've dealt with some crazy ish on the bus and not only that but people in LA have no concept of personal space on the bus um so this is these are perfect because I can sit there and knit on my own by myself and when somebody's all up on my personal space like this will be my seat and I'll be like half over on my seat because they've decided they want my seat too but I can sit here by the wall, by the window, and knit. So, that's why I wanted those. Last week, if you'll remember, I was working on a triangle shop. And if you need a memory refresher, it was this. It was the Perea in the Hawaii colorway. And it is 97% acrylic and 3% polyamide. Polyamide. Now... Uh, why can't I show you what's in here? Because as I was doing this shawl, it wasn't really based on a pattern so much as something I had seen. Um, however, once I came to a particular point in my pattern, I needed to make a change based on needle room. So um, I asked some fellow clerkers what I should do, and Don from the um, Who is Knitting Wolf of the Wolf Creeks podcast. Uh, or excuse me, Wolf Farm podcast, and I think I have Heather to blame for calling it Wolf Creek po Farms now, um, but it, from the Wolf Farms podcast, um, I asked what I should do, and um, Knit and Wolf told me that I should make it a design feature and release it as a pattern, um, and I think that um, Chaotic Hooker was the one that told me to release it as a pattern, and Don told me to to make it a design feature. So, three months ago, I didn't think I'd ever knit. Now I'm designing a flipping pattern. Go fig. Ow, I just hit my knee. So, I'm designing a pattern for beginners by a beginner. And basically, what this pattern is going to be is if you're new to knitting and you don't want to, God, that really hurt. Um, if you're new to knitting and you don't want to spend your entire knitting career or the beginning of your knitting career knitting washcloths, this pattern is going to be for you. Um, I always thought that in the beginning it's good to practice particular stitches or techniques over and over again. Yeah, but you want to do something that makes you feel accomplished and sometimes if you're not one of those people who is driven by dishcloths, more so by things that you've actually made yourself that you use and have fun using, then maybe it's more of a motivation tool, you know what I mean? So, um, I'm doing this pattern uh, for beginners by a beginner. And I'm releasing it for free download in the uh, Ravelry store as soon as I have it done. After I've had it test knit, of course. Um, so that's why I can't show it to you right now. But I'm making progress on it. I think I did, like, at least 12 rows since last you've seen it. I do need to do some serious work on it, but I've been really busy with everything else, so I haven't had a chance to just sit down with it and knit, but I need to finish that. Um, so that's that, um, and that's it for Craft That Whip. So next up we have Whirlwind. 
This week on Whirlwind, we have, we've had spinning. Oh, we've had spinning. See, I think I told you last week that, and I don't know what just happened to my light. It got kind of wonkified. That's a little bit better. Okay. Um, I don't know if I told you last week. No, I know I told you last week. That me and Marino, we were taking a breather because I got mad. Um, let me just... Let you remember, let me just give you a reminder. I am spinning six of my eight ounces of ridiculously soft 19.5 micron merino. Um, and it is naked dye, naked fiber. So I am spinning this stuff. And um, if you recall, it totally spun like crap Ola on my top whirl. Um, let me get it so I can show you. Resulting in this mess right here. So if you can see on my top whirl where I've been spinning, it's kind of bulky and not really consistent. And it looks like as soon as I spin it, the twist goes out. Um, and what I'm finding is that the top whirl spins a lot slower than my bottom whirl. Um, so that is what it is, and eventually I will pull a haul of this off and re-spin it on my bottom wall. So, this is going to get the heck away from my sight. Um, now let me show you what wonderfulness I have found spinning this fiber. Like, let me just show you real quick. This spins super fast, and it's spinning a little bit less fast because I have so much fiber on it now, but this spins super fast. And what I do is I pre-draft this out pretty thin, and then I basically just let the world take it, and it spins it on its own. These are, this is pretty much exactly the kind of strand that I'm getting. Um, that's probably not the best example of it. But, um, I am getting nice little strands of fiber. Some overspun, and you see that slub right here? That's because what Sasha's been doing is not keeping her fiber supply away from her whorl. And that's because I cannot seem to keep it from clinging to me. So if I put it too close to me, it clings to me. If I put it too close to the world, it clings to the world. There's nothing I can do, apparently. Um, so, I'm doing what I can. But I, it's mostly consistent. It's going to be a nice worsted once I've applied it, and I'll probably Navajo apply it, um, which is going to be difficult to do on a spindle, I believe. But I will, I'll figure something out. So that's my spinning, my spinification. Um, and again, let me stress for beginners out there, again, I think I said it last week, when you get your spindle, make sure it's got a notch in the whorl. Because that makes all the difference um, between having your fiber on your cup or your fiber on the floor. I was speaking with somebody who's in the, the Chasing Spindles Ravelry group, um, and they said that they didn't know what a staple length was. So I figured I would show you guys. Um, I'm not an expert, I'm still beginning myself, but I do know what a staple length is. So, um, staple length. A staple length is the amount of one, or the size rather, the length of one fiber. So when you draft this out, it's basically how long it takes for this and this to come apart. Um, so, let's say you're here, it's coming apart. Let's say you're here, and it's not coming apart. But then let's say you go further and farther apart, and it will come apart. So I would estimate, get off of me, the size of this merino, the staple length, is about this right here. So, um... That's pretty much how you find your staple length. It's um, not a total exact science, but some staple lengths are longer than others. 
um, like if you're beginning, I think a Corey Dale has a longer staple length. Um, I think Alpaca's got a pretty decent length of staple. Um, and I don't know what that other stuff I spun was, but that was a pretty long staple length, but I'm sure that doesn't help you. <laughs> um, if you do have any questions, please let me know, and I'll be more than happy to answer them. Just find the Ravelry group um, at Chasing Spindles. Just find the Ravelry group on Ravelry, or you can leave me a comment at uh, chasingspindles.blogspot.com. So that's pretty much it for Whirlwind. Um, let's get into Fiber Frenzy. Um, Fiber Frenzy is going to be a bit short this week because, let's face it, I don't know what to do. I'm spinning hand spun. I'm spinning um, naked fiber right now. And I kind of want to spin some colored fiber, but I don't really know where I want to get it from. And I don't really know if that's really what I want to get. Um, I'm really on the fence as to what fiber I want to try next. Um, I've tried Corydale, Merino, Alpaca, and whatever the fiber I'm about to show you is, but um, I don't I don't know what I I don't know what what I'll try next. I'd like to I know that there are different types of merino. Um, like the tensile merino, like the blends, the different blends and stuff. Um, and I'd like to try all different kinds, so I'm not sure what I, what I want or who offers like different fibers in like a sample pack. That would be cool. That'd be a great spindle. If I know that there are a lot of Etsy owners, so from a beginner, let me let me just let me throw this out there. A beginner sampler kit, okay, round about let's say fifty bucks. Two spindles, top and bottom whorl. Um, and a one ounce sample ball of whatever different kinds of fibers you can get. That would be the perfect beginner starter kit. Mine came with Corydale and that was just one fiber. Thanks to friends, I was able to spin many different kinds of fibers. As a matter of fact, I don't know if I mentioned, but actually I did last week. Um, the merino I bought was the first fiber I've ever had to purchase, um, thanks to my friends. So. If you guys had in your shops a nice beginner kit, there would be a lot of beginners who would buy that. And if you agree with me, then um, let, let Plurk know, let Ravelry know, let shop owners know. Beginner sampler kits are a good way to go. Um, so as far as that goes, I really, like I said, don't know what I'm going to do fiber-wise for a minute. Um, probably by next time I record, I will have something in mind or on the way. Um, so that is going to be a really short fiber frenzy. Now let's go ahead and get into BYOB. Okay. I have bought yarn. And there it went with the wonky light again. So after I recorded last week, my mom went to Big Lots and she brought back yarn for me. And it is in their dollar bin, so it ain't pretty, but it's functional. And actually, it is kind of pretty. This is Gala yarn, and it's mixed fiber yarn. It is nylon, polymer, and acrylic. And that's pretty accurate right there. So I got two skeins of that. And then I got that. And then I got that. And these are coming out pretty accurate, surprisingly. So I got four skeins of yarn total. So. Um, so, I would really like to make slippers out of these, but it's very bulky yarn. I just think it would make great slippers. But my feet aren't that big, so I wouldn't need that bulky of yarn. But if you guys should happen to know of a um, pattern that calls for bulky weight for slippers, 
let me know. Post it on Plurk or something. Find me on Ravelry. Post it in the group. Something. Um, so yeah, I got that. And then, um, as I showed you earlier, I had the yarn that I found in Stash that I didn't know I had. So it's kind of like finding yarn, buying yarn again. So let's go ahead and get into I Made It slash Epic Pass, Epic Fail. Okay, so in this week's Epic Pass, Epic Fail, we have the things and settings and junk from the dye pots. Um, and I lost them. Oh, there they are. Okay. So, um, I really tried to do something to make progress with the things that I did. Um, it was not disappointing, but just sad that it was a self-fulfilled prophecy that it turned out the way that it did. Um, I'm not easily discouraged, but it is what it is. And my computer is making noise, I don't know if you can hear that. Um, but it is what it is. So with that being said, this is my first hand spun hand dyed yarn and this was just cake dyed and then this is the alpaca and that was mystery fiber this was the alpaca that was dyed in the grape and the blue cake dye and you can see little bits of white which is kind of how I wanted it because there are bits of white in the yarn that I'm about to use for my sister's scarf so those are both my hand dyed hand spun hand dyed yarns and I'm pretty proud of them so I give them both a pass so now let me get into future plans before my battery dies because my camera is about to die um future plans uh, so it is booked finalized it's etched in stone we are going to Portland in May and in May we will be celebrating my grandma's birthday in Portland um, me and Kiata Cooker are going to go and hit up all the yarn shops and hang out with all the yarn peoples and so if you live in Portland then hi we're on our way in May so that is a future plan um also um be on the lookout for more um natural dyeing so I'm gonna go ahead and end the show right now before my battery dies and goes and I'm so surprised that I finally freaking got this recorded after trying to do it a bunch of times yesterday so um, just really quickly if you're gonna start something new and it's newly creative to you don't be attached to the outcome make a mess make a sound it doesn't matter if it's a Van Gogh painting or a symphony orchestra the point is you made it and your idea of perfection may not be the same as someone else's idea of perfection so be creative and don't be attached to your outcome Okay, so I'll see you guys next week. Have a good week, and keep chasing spindles. Bye. So my camera, or rather my computer, is actually charging right now, and so that's why you're seeing the mess behind me instead of the clear, ba clear background I had before. But I forgot to show you one of the things that actually turned out pretty good in the basic natural dye. See this bag? You see it? You see it? See the color of it? See how it's kind of faint, but you can see it, and you can tell what color it is? This is a naturally dyed project bag, dyed from beet juice. This is the only thing that took the natural dye, the majority of the natural dye. And the funny thing is, is that this is not a natural fiber, it's a microfiber bag. So the one thing I thought would not take at all, only took the natural dye. It did not take the red in the cake dye. That, that would have made it a lot more red than it became, than this is. This is the color of the beet juice. So, I do have an epic pass this week. Epic pass! So it just goes to show you that you might have 15 million things go wrong, but hey, there's one that went right. So here we are getting ready to dye. This is our vinegar and water bath. Um, we just bought a small bottle of vinegar, it's just the distilled vinegar, and then I f um, dumped this whole bottle right here, and then um, we fill I fill this half up with water. So that is what our bath is made out of, and now I'm going to be adding some cream of tartare.
Okay, so I'm just going to add kind of a healthy amount to the dye bath. Because this is all mordanting. Um, so I've got like a nice little amount there and then I'm just going to stir it in. With my spoon. And while the dye sits in here, we will be eating awesome fresh pasta and chicken with pesto sauce. So, how's that for food safe? That stuff is right by the stuff we're dying with. Okay, so to dye today, we were going to be using some grapes and some onions, red onions with the skins, which we'll be using just the skins. And in this bag are some beets, and I have never eaten or seen a beet before, so there we go. And the dye bath is all ready, and there is yarn being skeined up, and I'm keeping your face out of it. So. Thank you, because my hair is a mess, dude. Because I'm using my scrunchie to hold the yarn. So, over here we have not a pre boily type thing going on, but we have a uh, our, our lunch boiling. And then... Our little setup is the pans, and then we have these cake dyes, which if we epically fail, there will be cake dye in here. There we go, there's all the colors. These are the Wilton cake dyes, and they're awesome, I guess, because we haven't used them yet. Okay, so in the dye bath right now, I'm putting the Naked Mystery Fiber, which I made a mess of right there. So we'll see how that comes out. I'm just throwing those in there, and I'm doing mini skeins for my test run before we start the huge, huge vats of dye, which are the merino and whatever other fibers we have. This is alpaca, and these are already tied off. I'm actually going to, well, actually the, um, the naked mystery fiber is not tied off, but that's alright. Um, and then. I have a bag of fiber poop right here, and I'm going to put these scraps that are in here, and then I'm going to dye this bag. So here we have beets, here we have onions, just the skins of red onions, and then we have grapes. And well, what I did is I boiled water, and then as we were chopping up all the ingredients to make them ready, um... I um, boiled water and then we just poured them into the pans and now we're stirring them with a spoon. Mm -hmm. 